Okay, everybody, my guest on the show today is Anna Fulmer. Anna is the author and owner of the leading health style lifestyle blog, Hammers and Hugs. She is a fellow podcaster, a dual certified nurse practitioner. She's a fitness and nutrition coach. And as I just found out, a coffee aficionado, snob, obsession, OCD. I don't know, Anna, you tell us. what What's the proper term for somebody like you with coffee? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> all of all the, the above. above coffee knob yes <laughs> all it. addict it's all appropriate all appropriate all right <laughs> i think we're just gonna spend the whole episode talking about your coffee obsession that's that's what the that's what the people are here for <laughs> i'd rather spend the whole episode drinking coffee but we can talk yeah well about do you have too. coffee with you right now <laughs> are you drinking coffee right now um, I've already had three cups and it's nine thirteen in the morning. So this actually is water in oh, it now. Yeah, like for those listening, Anna is not on the ceiling, which means you have a high caffeine tolerance. <laughs> she's sitting down, she's still calm. I have a very high caffeine tolerance. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Well so uh thank you. Still calm, not shaking. You're not shaking. You seem calm. I'm very impressed. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Delighted to have you on <laughs> today. And we're gonna get right into it because I know we have a thank lot. You. To talk about. So first things first, what's something that you nerd out about? And let's just take coffee off the table because we've already, I think we've already covered covered that with your three cups by 915. Yeah, it's fair. Coffee would be up there. I, I'm a nerd about British literature. Mm. I love classic Brit lit. I thought I was going to be an English teacher or something in that vein in high school. <laughs> not medicine, not the 20 letters behind my name. I have nothing to do with literature, yeah. but I love British literature. I'm British at heart. We've just figured this out. Oh, wow. We have, I'm really British we have, at heart. Jane Austen is my Jane favorite. Jane Austen. I was going to ask you, like, em Emily Bronte, is, she's British. Yeah, yeah. Jane Austen. What's, um... Yep. Do yep. you also like yeah. British television? Yes. Um... Yeah, so many different, like the Masterpiece channel. Mm -hmm. um, what's his name? Julian Andrews, I think. He writes so many British TV shows. He's a mastermind. We So the backstory, I think one of the reasons that I have this love for most things British is we actually lived in Britain for four nice. years when I was growing up. My dad was getting his doctorate in Scotland. So for the first four years of my life, I lived in Britain. And then when we came back to the States, I think it had become so ingrained in our home. My parents brought so much of the British culture with them. Neither of my parents drink coffee, by the way. They both drink tea. I drink tea. There <laughs> you go. Living in Britain. I have someone coming. So I think we just grew. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So I think we just grew up watching British shows, reading British literature. I don't know. My brother was born over in Britain. Nice. Anyway. I'm British at heart, but Jane Austen is, she's yeah, amazing. Yeah, I, I'm not, I like, I like British literature fine. Like, I like, uh, I like, like, Lord of the Rings. Obviously, he's British, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. J.J.R.R. Mm -hmm. Tolkien. Yep, Tolkien. And Tolkien. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I love Brits, too, yeah. so we have something in common there. I, I, when I, in my corporate career, I would, <laughs> I supported accounts based in London, and I just, I find the, I love the, dr okay. I love the drinking culture. You go to the pub after work and there's ages like 21 yeah. to like 90, all hanging at the bar together, the pub together. I love the humor. Yeah. I, I think British comedy is just the best. It's like so my type of humor. And I find, I don't know how you feel about, I find the Brits just like so sensible. And so like they don't take them, my experience with British people, they don't take themselves so seriously. Like it's like, they, it's like a work hard, play hard culture. So I, I'm a, also a big fan of the Brits. I would say I, I have a crush on Brits yeah. too. And I'm jealous that you live there because I've been to London a few times, but I've never <laughs> had a chance to live. But that that's so cool. Yeah, I was very young. So I, I would love to get back to Scotland and England. I would love to go to Ireland. Really, just Britain. All yeah, of it. All of it. <laughs> that's awesome. So, Anna, we're going to talk a little bit about your comfort zone. So what I, what I mean by mm -hmm. that is the thing that's easy for you, natural. You're more than happy to do it. What's something that's inside of your comfort zone that you know is outside of other people's comfort zones? Human blood and guts. Well, that would make sense since you are a nurse. 
<laughs> I would hope that would be. He's like, huh? Yeah. Where do I go with that? Yeah. So it doesn't bother you at all? Like gore? Yeah. I think just the concept of no, mm. no, no, just the, um, yeah, the reality of the human body and the inside and the outside, what would be within my comfort zone is, is probably outside of most people's understandably. So, yeah, I mean, that's when, did you, was that always a thing that you were comfortable with? And that's part of the reason you, you did what you did, or is was that like something that you built up over time from going through school and learning? Uh, yes, it was definitely not something I was always comfortable with. In fact, I've seen very often in my life that the things that I say I will never do end up being the very thing that I end up doing. And medicine was one of those kind of the funny story is when I was in, I think it was first grade. I joke that I watched my mom kill my dad in our dining room. And what happened was from my young eyes, that's exactly what it looked like. She was an ICU nurse. She still yeah. is worked in intensive care for many, many years and had to draw my dad's blood. My dad needed a fasting blood draw. And in the spirit of efficiency, my mom collected what she needed and then drew my dad's blood at home at our kitchen table. And he either hadn't had enough to drink or who knows exactly what happened, but basically he passed out before my eyes. I watched him go white as a wow. sheet and pass out. And certainly it was not a very long experience, but to my very young eyes, my mom killed my dad and then he <sighs> came back to life. I was terrified of needles and all of it for many, many years. Uh, Even imagine. my first year in nursing school, <laughs> we had to practice um, blood sugar tests on our own fingers. Yeah. And I mean, I had to deep breathe to not hyperventilate. But the bottom line was I senior year looked at the entire list of majors at the school that I was going to and the one that I thought I was going to major in, it just was not sitting right. And I was like, all right, God, you got to tell me what I'm supposed to do because I'm not sure I'm not feeling good about this. And I just instantly knew even though it was what I'd said I'd never do, I needed to go into medicine. And two masters later, <laughs> 20 letters behind my name later, uh, that was my story. Oh, wow. So medicine it was. And so now human blood and guts are like, ah, no Yeah, big deal. so when the kids hurt themselves, you have children. Kids hurt themselves. You're like, I got it. It's good. Mama the yes. nurse. Do you have all of your limbs? Are you <laughs> gushing blood anywhere? You're breathing. You're talking. You will be, be fine. fine. <laughs> Did um, and you don't have to share with us yeah. if you don't want to, but I'm curious. Have you gotten therapy around that story around your parents? Because that's very traumatic as a little child. Have you have you uncovered that inner child work at some point in your adult? You're like, oh my gosh, mom killed dad. Where does that still show up in my life today? <laughs> uh, no, I feel like I've had so many more significant things happen since <laughs> then. It was definitely not a. It was not something that I needed therapy for down yeah. the road. I think it was one of those things where you face your own fears, you realize you can rise above them, and that's sort of the therapy that you need. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure I could use therapy for something, but I don't think it's I don't think it's that anymore. There you go. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can uncover something and maybe do some live. You know, I'm not a therapist. We can do some live stuff here. We'll, we'll hey, take, live therapy live, session. I, I, it's, I, I didn't tell you this when I set I'm you up to be on the show, but I actually have a therapist next to me. This is this is what the point of the show is. We get people in and get them get digging deep, and then like, by the way, it's live therapy on a podcast. That would be an interesting, <laughs> an interesting podcast. Exactly. Um, so on the flip side of that, yeah, hey, I'll take a free therapy. Yeah, session. exactly. Blood and guts. That's actually the first time on this show in 120 some episodes that somebody's had that is inside their comfort zone. So you get the prize <laughs> for the most gory answer to that. That's great. Uh, yeah, it is. Yes. We'll Love take a it. look at the other side of that. So what's something that is outside of your comfort zone that you know is inside of other people's? Animals. Animals. <laughs> need, um, well, the oh, irony in it all, we this. laugh in our house especially little animals. Like if I'm on a run and there, I don't know what my problem is. If there's like a little dead animal on the path and I happen to see it, it, I will shoot forward. Like I'm running the hundred meter dash. Like it gives me chills up and down my spine, like little dead animals for some reason, just 
freak me out if there's like a dead bird in our backyard. It gives me like chills up and down. There's something so strange, I know, but I have to get my husband to go get rid of the little dead animal. So it's not like I'm terrified of animals. Like give me a sweet puppy any day to hold. Like it's not like I'm scared of animals, yeah. but like little dead animals or rodents, mice terrify me totally outside of my comfort zone. I will happily hand it off. I would be less freaked out to see a dead body mm. in my backyard than a little dead rabbit. <laughs> Again, you definitely hey, get an award for yeah, the most yep. interesting answer in this one. too. <laughs> This is this is the this is the quote of the episode. I'd rather see a dead body. That's the quote of the episode. And yet, Anna, anyone I'd rather see who a dead knows body me and my family will rabbit. heartily say that That's is one hundred percent true. It would freak me out less. Yeah. <laughs> so funny. I uh, I'm I'm just gonna yeah. tell you because we're gonna we're we're moving towards a therapy session. We have a one year old golden retriever. I would and she not brought do in well a dead rat yeah. a few weeks ago into the house mm. and dropped it for us because she was really no. proud of that. Yeah, it sounds like you wanted. We, we'd be but good. You're like, but yeah. if she found yeah. a dead body no in the I woods, spent hours in the cadaver okay. lab. I That's love fine. dead bodies. <laughs> also, not something you've probably had anyone say. But it's fascinating. The pathology and the physiology is is fascinating. Uh, no, I Animals, think... nah, no thanks. No, no. Yeah, I feel like I feel like you should. I feel like we're starting to concept a really interesting television show pilot. <laughs> like this person who's like an amazing serial killer solver. Yeah, but like a rabbit is like they can't. It's like like Clarice Starling from <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. Like. They're going to solve but all the cases. She could be like, with the yeah, most yeah. psychotic people on the planet, dead bodies. But like, there's a mouse it in the is... corner that's died. And... <laughs> or the, either that or this is your it's Avenger my superhero. Tonight. My You're kryptonite like, is, you can be with is mice and <laughs> little kryptonite. dead animals. It is 100% true. If somebody wants to paralyze me, that's they know how to now. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, remember that if you ever want to paralyze Anna. Yeah, you you got it. Pulled up like a dead mouse or a squirrel or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to dig in on this, but I'm not going to because it's very entertaining. Okay, Anna, so I'm going to give you five minutes. And by the way, you don't have to take five minutes here on the show. But if I was to able be able to give you five minutes and you were able to speak to the entire world, yeah, what is it that you'd want? What message would you want to deliver to us? And what would be your call to action to us at the end of your speech? Mm. It would be titled Overcoming Inadequacy. The culture that we live in is constantly telling us that we need to cover up our sense of inadequacy. We need to hide it because it makes us feel weak or imperfect. And this is often conveyed subconsciously, sometimes overtly. But for example, society tells us as women that we are more valuable if we are outwardly beautiful, skinny, young, if we look a certain way or have a certain body fat percentage. And wrinkles, something as simple and superficial and mm. non-life-threatening as wrinkles are considered imperfect. I don't know who decided that, but the reality is we are willing to undergo invasive procedures to get rid of something as superficial and benign as wrinkles. We are willing to eliminate entire food groups from our diets to try to redefine our age and our body and meet a societal standard of worth, basically to cover up that feeling of inadequacy or the fear of irrelevance if we start to age and look older. Men are told that they are valuable if they are wealthy and high achieving, and they're willing then to work 12 hours a day to get the bigger house or the nicer car to try to redefine that sense of worth and, again, cover up a a feeling of inadequacy and 
we think that by doing more and striving for greatness, even if it's a respectable goal, I mean, there there could be a feeling of inadequacy or a sense of inadequacy that that we do want to overcome and we want to educate ourselves and grow. So it's not inherently bad. It probably depends on what the goal is. But the fact is we are constantly striving to overcome, to hide that sense of inadequacy and redefine who we are. But we can't. We cannot be redefined, Mm. only redeveloped. From the moment we were knit together in our mother's wombs, you, me, all of us as mankind, we were defined with infinite value by a divine creator made in his image, placed on this earth for a glorious purpose, instantly valuable and loved. And nothing we can say or do can add to or detract from that worth. We are all enough because we were instantly defined with that infinite value the moment we were supernaturally and amazingly and divinely knit together in our mother's wombs, the beauty of being human. We cannot be redefined. You are enough as you are today, before and after, but you can be redeveloped. And this is where my brand comes in. Everything that I do is with this purpose in mind is redeveloping holistically, emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and socially redeveloping to fulfill that God-given purpose with more confidence, energy, freedom, and joy because every single person's story matters. You're loved. You cannot be redefined, only redeveloped. And if you want to truly overcome that sense of inadequacy, it's not about doing more It's or even trying to become greater. It is embracing <coughs> the fact that you are inadequate embracing the imperfection and living out of that and using that as your unique story to change the world because that story matters in all of its beautiful yeah, that's amazing Anna. so you know i we know we know a little bit about each other and you know that i have i have a i have a six-year-old daughter yeah you have a you have daughters as well don't you do you have do you have daughters or sons i have a nine-year-old and a four-year-old daughter yeah. and a seven-year-old son and one son coming yeah. through adoption. So you got the fam. So yeah. I think you know where I'm going to go with this. How do you, how do you talk about this wildly important topic with young women? Mm. Mm. Um, I think the me- the message is very much the same. The mode of delivery and the context is slightly different. So my nine-year-old daughter especially is entering that stage where she is starting to recognize that she may be better or not as good at certain things Mm -hmm. as other girls. You know, you enter that state of comparison very, very early on. And one of the conversations that we will frequently have is, first of all, helping her see other people instead of a sense of turning that around and making her feel badly about herself, to actually turn it around and teach her how to uplift the very person that she may be comparing herself to. One of the things that we struggle with as women when we when we start to feel that sense of inadequacy and comparison is we so quickly make it about ourselves. I am not enough. I'm not pretty enough. I am not talented enough. And one of the ways to fight that is if she compares herself to another classmate, and I have Mm -hmm. to do this in my own life as an adult, and let's just say it's Susie, and she'll say, I'm not pretty as pretty as Susie. And I'll say, what is it about Susie that you think is really pretty? And she'll list off whatever it may be. And I'll say, well, you know what, we should be really happy for her and let her know that because maybe she doesn't feel good about herself and you think she's pretty. That's a beautiful thing. Make sure you let her know that because I bet it would mean a lot to her. And that sense of, first of all, turning it back to that very person and being being willing to assume an attitude of, I'm happy for you in your, as a woman in my stage, 
success. If I see somebody who has what I want, I am very intentional about instead of turning that around and making me feel badly about myself, I capture that thought and instead I turn it around and I say, you know what? Good for her. I am truly, truly happy for her because she's earned it. I know, I know the struggle, right? I know what it takes to be successful and she's done it. And I am not going to turn that around and say, you know, woe is me. Instead, I'm going to say good for her and I'm going to celebrate her. So step number one with my daughter is I I encourage her to celebrate, to celebrate somebody else's success in her little, in her little nine-year-old world that may be, you know, something as much as her little classmates drawing was better than hers. And I say, you know what? Let's be happy for her. Let's celebrate that. Like good for her. And then the second thing that I will have her do is, is stop and think, okay, what can I learn from this? If I want to grow, if I want to become better in something, if it is, you know, an achievement based, something that you can develop, we'll stop and say, okay, what can I learn from this person? I do this. All right. That woman who has accomplished what it is that I want to accomplish, what can I learn from her? What is it that she's doing that maybe I could do better? And again, it's not that sense of woe is me. I can't do it. It's more so, all right, what can Mm -hmm. she teach me and how can I grow based on what I have watched her do? So I also encourage my daughter to think that way. Again, if it's an achievement based thing or something that she can actually do when it comes to simply who she is, her little God given self, her physical, her physical features, it is constantly that reminder that your worth has nothing to do with what you mm. see in the mirror, but it is because God has made you in his image and you are enough as you are right now because yeah. he loves you, period. I love you too, but more importantly, he yeah. loves you and that will never change. That's beautiful, Anna. So it yeah. is. It's a, it's a constant constant yeah. uh, battle yeah, for, all I mean, the, the, for all of us. For all of us. I know us. you know this term, but like compare and despair is a, such a toxic thing. The, um, and it's like our daughter is sick. She just turned six. So I don't think we're quite there yet, but you know, it, it, it comes, as you know, as a parent, it comes fast Yeah, and that must be really, Ooh, it does. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy it now. And there's just like, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's human. You know, and I think that's the, that's the piece to it is it's, it's human and, the struggle is real, whether you're eight years old, 38 years old, or 68 years yeah. old. Like it's kind of part of that journey. And that sense of inadequacy is is part of being human, but it's making sure that at the end of the day, your worth, you understand that it is in some it's yeah. outside of you. You've been given it by a divine, a divine creator that is outside of you. And there's such freedom in that. Yeah. It puts us all in the Absolutely. same playing field. It doesn't matter how successful you are. You are no better (laughs) than anybody else. And even if you have had the roughest life and you have made some of the worst decisions and you face those consequences, the fact is you, you still matter and you are loved and you are as, as worthy as anyone else. You've given me a lot to think about and everybody listening a lot to think about with that. We're going to take a very Mm. brief commercial break and we'll be right back after this. The Talking to Cool People podcast is brought to you by Jason Frizzell Coaching. Jason works with amazing people who are looking to find and develop their passion and purpose and create their journey to wherever it is they want to go. Check us out at jasonfrizzell.com, Facebook, or on Instagram. Jason loves hearing from anyone who thinks it would be cool to connect, to be coached, or to be a guest on our show. Email him at podcast at jasonfrizzell.com or DM him on Facebook and Instagram. And now, back to some more amazing conversation on talking to cool people. All right, Anna, we are back. So let's see what we know about you so far. Coffee. We got coffee. (laughs) We have dead people. Dead people, dead animals. It has, but this has been a wide-ranging conversation. conversation. We went deep on <laughs> compare and despair. There it That's is. That's me. Welcome. I, to, this uh, is why you're on my, my show world. because I was like, I got to talk to this person <laughs> because I know it's going to be an awesome, <sighs> awesome conversation. It's been amazing so far. <laughs> so at this point, what else do you want us to know about you? 
Yeah, small, oh, you know, boy. small close-ended question. <laughs> How much time do you have? Oh, you what do you want to know questions? about me? What I do want you want to well, know. Yeah, like if you're going to throw it back to sure. me. Um, I'm really curious how, what was the inspiration for the blog? I just find blogging interesting because that, that's something you've actually built a business out of. Mm. So I'm, I'm interested in that. Like I find, like I don't, yeah. part of the reason I'm interested in this is one, it's really core to your brand. And two, like I hate writing, which is why I podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I love talking. I love listening and asking yeah. questions. I do not like writing. <laughs> so what, what was the inspiration for the blog? Yeah, and, the, yeah. and what was the what was the transition for you from, Hey, I've got all these letters behind my name. I've, I'm a highly skilled and highly trained person in a field right. to, Hey, I'm a podcaster and I've got a, you know, a fitness brand and I'm a blogger. Like what, how did that transition go for you? Yeah. Well, so as you know, in the spirit of consistency here, again, a little bit of a lot happening, Bottom line, I worked in emergency medicine for 10 years. I'm a nurse practitioner by education. I got my first master's at Hopkins. Super, super ingrained in the medical world. I helped start up two stroke programs and acted as the assistant medical director of those programs. Part of that role then transitioned into speaking. I did a lot of presentations speaking around the country even one of the things that I spoke on was disease prevention, specifically how to prevent strokes, which certainly also wraps into just cardiovascular health in general. And it gave me this incredible ability to speak on something that I am very passionate about, which is disease prevention. Again, I spent a decade of my life treating acute illness and stabilizing and there's no time. There's no time to go into the fact that you don't really need another blood pressure medicine. You need mm -hmm. a lifestyle change and you don't have time to dive into that. But in the end, that's really what makes all the difference. So there was that happening on the professional side. In the personal side of things, my husband and I both got our first master's at John Hopkins. This was about nine years ago now, 10 years ago now. And when we came back to Lancaster County, we were energy mm -hmm. rich, but cash poor. So we decided a good investment for our very first home <laughs> would be a fixer upper. <laughs> and it was a crazy fixer upper. Like we bought an old Victorian and there was not a square corner, a 90 degree angle in the entire house. Nothing was level. It was an unbelievable, like we basically started going straight uphill we learned so much from it. And then when we resold it or when we sold it, we did quite well. And we thought, well, good grief. We got kind of good at this. We should probably do it again. So we bought a second fixer upper. This one was a foreclosure. And it was while we were in this house that the one night while I was spouting some sort of frustration with work and medicine, by the way, we were all frustrated mm -hmm. in medicine, even before yep. COVID hit, in case you didn't know. Um. But he said, jokingly, you should make your millions blogging. <laughs> and I said, first of all, what is a blog? I love that. I had, <laughs> this was only three years ago. At the time, I had no idea that when I would Google how to install a backsplash, for example, that it was actually taking me to somebody's blog. I didn't understand that on the internet, that's what I was reading was somebody's blog. And as I started to dive into it, it was such a fun challenge to me. And I, I love writing. And again, that whole like Brit lit English major part of my, my life, that's actually what comes very naturally to me. So I started this whole journey of creating what I call a digital scrapbook. I fell in love with blogging because I was able to feed the creative side. I was able to share the DIY things that we were just organically doing in our lives. My husband is a computer programming teacher and a football coach. So this was truly yeah. like a side hustle. And it just became this whole this whole thing. I had no social media before I started blogging. Suddenly I had a virtual presence. I was able to become a fitness and nutrition coach for a virtual program that was founded by a classmate of mine from college. It just opened this whole new world of opportunities for me. And I transitioned about a year ago away from bedside medicine in the ER. And I now practice preventative medicine mm -hmm. and empowering holistic wellness through everything. 
through DIY strategies to reclaim your home. And um, we all know the home is directly tied to our mental and emotional oh, yeah. well-being. So, yeah, it's a little, a little bit of yeah, a lot. So I was picturing you and your husband a little bit. I, I was picturing Chip and Joanna, but the Lancaster County version of them. Not the Waco, Texas. I don't know if, like, <laughs> yeah. we're we're big we're big fans. I'm gonna have them on the show someday, hopefully. Yes, that's cool. That's cool, and I love. Yeah, I love your deadpan delivery. Yeah. Of, we had a lot of energy and not a lot of money, so we did a fixer upper because anybody who's ever fixed up a house knows. No, very that little money. Even if you do most of it yourself, there are so many hidden costs <laughs> and things. You're like, you're like, we have a budget. It's it's. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And totally. I made like, a you're lot like, of oh, it's going to cost about five thousand dollars to do oh, this yeah. kitchen if we buy the materials ourselves. And then you're like, and we've been we, my wife and I are not fixer uppers. Right. It's just not our thing. But it's like, and then you open up the wall and you're like, oh wait, the wiring's not up to code. Yeah, and the, there's no insulation here. And oh, there's uh, dead animals in the wall, which would yeah. be your uh, probably your specifically your horror movie. Exactly. So, kudos to you. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, That's where I call in my chip. <laughs> His name is Zach. Like, <laughs> you're like Zach. Here's this Zach. Is, this one's there, yours. There's a, there, it seems like there's a skeleton back here. This is interesting to me. The animals here, it's a hard no go. That's really cool. Well, yeah. thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Anna. That's exactly so, right. Let's flip yeah. the script. Yeah. What do you want to ask me that I can answer for everybody listening and you? Ooh. All right, friends. What do we want to ask Jason? Um. Okay, if you could take an all expenses paid trip to anywhere around the world whenever you wanted. So as often as you wanted, mm. like this is yours to go to mm-hmm. for life, this place. Mm. Where would it be? But it's a got Yeah. So it's not necessarily yeah. where you live. This is your getaway. All yeah. expenses but it, but it, paid, nothing else to worry about. But it has about. to be like it magically takes Wow, this care of if you have a way to do every this every time. I will pay you a lot of money to solve this for me. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Is this? Uh, I just want to make sure I understand. <laughs> I have to pick one specific location that I would be going to. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, this is Oof. where you go. Time's not an issue, so like flying, lo- the logistics don't matter. Cool. No, nothing. This is so, it's like, so this is like a Star Trek itself. transporter. Exactly. Like I hop on a pad and then I'm in the place. Man, that is interesting. What a great question. Correct. I'm, I'm thinking about where I've been. And I think it's somewhere I haven't been before. And off the top of my head, what comes to mind is I have three things in mind. Let me process this. Can I give you three options or I need to pick one? Okay. You can give me three you options. Will allow that. I will well, allow yes, that that's, since it's your podcast. Yes, I'm asking permission from you. But you're, you know, you're kind of the boss over here. I, I mean, it's pretty obvious the power dynamics <laughs> happening on this podcast. So I'm just trying to respect <laughs> the new host of this podcast. I like it. Um, so I have three, I have three <laughs> things that pop in. One, somewhere in Norway on a fjord. Okay. Like have a house, like. Norway on a fjord. It is cold, fjord. but I'm from Minnesota. That I like cold. it cold. It, well, it, it's it's cold in the winter. It's huh. unbelievable in the summer. We've been okay. in my my wife's family are pure Norwegian, so we've been to Norway. It's it's spectacular. The second thing okay. that came to mind, and I've never been, is Tokyo, because I'm a huge city city person. You know, live in New York City. I love people. I'm a complete extrovert, so I like crowded. Okay. Tokyo would be a place. Well, Tokyo would be the and right place. The third then. place <laughs> would. be be i think it would have to be turks and caicos which is where we had our honeymoon but the okay. idea and there's yeah you're like you're like that's yeah, that sounds one i can warm. get that's on board with. around that's cool <laughs> and there's just this these cool islands in turks and caicos with like there's like this private island where keith richards has a house and i think bruce willis has a house and it's and you have to take a boat to get there and it's like a few houses i think that would be pretty dope to have like a, I don't need a. I wouldn't actually want a private island. I'd want to have neighbors that I could like walk to, but I would like to have a spot on the ocean that overlooks nothing but the ocean, yeah. and have like my close friends around me. So yeah, like and you can see those are kind of three different, three yeah. pretty different things. But but that actually makes a lot of sense if you know my personality. Like I get bored easily, so I would not want to choose one. I will say, but I also am a big fan yeah. of answering the actual question. 
So if I had to choose one of those, I would choose I would choose I would actually choose Tokyo. <laughs> yeah. You're like, no. Okay. You're like, I live in Lancaster wow. County. Well, there you go. You're like, Gandalf nope. can wave yeah. his magic wand. I live in that new Tokyo. tower. <laughs> yeah, Tokyo yeah. would definitely not be mine, yeah, exactly. but that's okay. To each their own. Yeah. We I all just, need well, to and also enjoy two years into things. a pit. Yeah. You exactly. can't you can't all be on two years my into beach. a pandemic as well. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I've been talking Some to people. Some of you need to go to Tokyo. Looking at people on Zoom and virtual for two years now, I, I could I could use some human interaction, like more human interaction. Uh, all right, so we actually right, have time. Right. You want to ask me something else? Well, hmm. What is your favorite mm-hmm. flavor yeah, of tea? Like you green, said you're like a tea, tea drinker, right? I don't like. Actually, don't really like black tea. I don't really like okay. orange tea, like Earl Grey. I like, yeah. I like green tea. I found the, yeah, I, yeah. I, I found. I don't. Do you watch Ted Lasso? Yeah. Oh, it's so good. No. Ted Lasso has a great quote, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hack this up, buddy. You know the concept, right? Ted Lasso, the show of yeah. what? Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. I don't even know who. Yeah, Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso is. is a show on Apple ignorance. TV. And it stars Jason Sudeikis from Saturday Night Live, and Ted Lasso okay. is a college football coach who goes and becomes okay. the head the head coach of a soccer team in England. And so he's like okay. he's like a very like nice American mm. could be more mid, like very middle of America, and he goes to England. And there's a scene, a great scenery where they're they're offering him tea. Okay. He's not a tea drinker because he's very American, and he's like he's like yeah yeah I thought that this would taste like brown water. And boy, I was right. <laughs> like, it's like, but yeah, I like green tea. I think it has a bit more of a flavor. But on the subject of tea, as we wrap this part of it up, I'm going to do a really interesting, what I find interesting. Do you know that all tea leaves are the same and the color of tea depends on how long they're left to dry? I didn't either. Hmm, and I read I about it. That. A green, green tea is the same leaf as black tea. It's how long it's left in the sun to dry. So it's the processing that creates the okay. color of the tea. Yeah, I was like, I was like oh, no, it's like huh. different leaves, but no, according to the, what I read, that's not true. Well, I like peppermint that's tea, a little so supplement, a little lovely girl. supplement in there. Yeah, peppermint tea is good. It's very refreshing. I like that. Peppermint, yeah. All right, so there you go. Yeah. Green yeah. tea. I'm a green tea drinker. Yeah. All right, Anna. There you go. Yes. Uh, people are like, wondering. thank God, after two seasons, I've finally learned this about Jason. So important. All right. So, Anna, what are you passionate about? <laughs> well, we've already established yes. several things. Coffee. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> the beach. Warm weather. Passionate about all of those things. Um, British literature. I'm a passionate about a lot of things. If you... What about... Um, so you have part of your brand is fitness, right? You speak about fitness. Yeah. Tell me, I'd love to hear a little bit more, but I know you're really passionate about fitness, both for yourself and for all of us out here. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because we haven't covered that part yet. Yeah. Well, if we want to dig into what I'm passionate about in that specific arena, and I will keep my soapbox to hopefully less than three hours, but one of the things that I am very passionate about is helping people understand why they need to ditch mm-hmm. the scale. If you are listening and you are currently weighing yourself on a scale and you are measuring your fitness nutrition progress, not to mention your own self-worth on a number based on that scale, then you need to ditch it like yesterday. And the reason is because even though you've probably heard it, muscle weighs more than fat and muscle takes Mm -hmm. up less space than fat. So as we all know, you can be losing inches, replacing disease promoting fat with disease preventing muscle and still weigh the same number on the scale. And that is partly because you are changing your density. So you are decreasing the amount of space that you take up, but it is heavier because muscle weighs more than fat. So the number on the scale is a terrible reflection, but here is the other issue. 
is you can technically be very lean in terms of your body fat percentage and be considered overweight based on a traditional Mm -hmm. BMI calculator. So the problem with the scale is that is a terrible reflection of our overall health. So what I am passionate, my clients hear me say it many, many times, but you need to start measuring body fat percentage because this is a much better indicator of your disease risk as well as a measurement of progress in terms of fitness and nutrition. I talk about it on my blog. There's a blog post to help people very easily measure their body fat at home. It is simply a body caliper. It costs 12 bucks. There is no reason for the average adult or even teenager to be weighing themselves unless you have one of a very few chronic medical conditions. Nobody should be weighing themselves with any regularity. There, yeah, that's that's a that's what I'm passionate about. <laughs> and coffee. You're like all of the things I just said, and also drink a lot uh. of coffee. Coffee is good, and coffee. Thank you. And that, coffee. That's a great message. Yeah, because like that's one of the things that that's an interesting message too. Because one of the common things in weight loss vernacular is weigh yourself every day to see the progress. I hear that a lot, and. Yeah. 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 Well, it's Don't also it. frustrating because sometimes your body just retains more water or like that it's, is bull. also your body is not just going to like, it's not going to straight drop on an angle. It's going to, it depends on your activity and all those things. Yep. And weight loss. Yeah. Weight loss yeah. is not the goal. It's, it's fat loss. If we're going to start changing the vernacular or the semantics of it, then that is, that yeah. is what it needs to change. <clears throat> In yeah. order to live well, not look a certain way, but live well, which the appearance yeah. aspect of it nice. often comes. So, with Anna, that. what's the thing in your life that you are most yeah. proud of? Holy smokes! The thing that I am most proud of, uh, probably the fact <laughs> that my children are all still alive. <laughs> I like that you stopped it. They're all still alive. Like that's the bar that's been set. They're still alive. It changed. I mean, with each of my children, the bar dropped lower and lower. And now I truly am just proud of the That's fact great. that I've been able to keep That's them alive. Like the first one, you're like, I'm proud. I'm yeah. Our son, it's really, yeah. truly miraculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, our first, our first one, Gracie, we were like, we're such good parents. She was so flexible. She just did whatever we wanted her to do. She would stay up till 10 o'clock and still be happy, go lucky and sleep in the next morning. <laughs> she was so easy. And then our son came along and we were like, oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> okay, so we're actually not good parents. It's just our daughter yeah. had the right personality, and our goal just became y- keeping. Yeah, this is this is all alive. resonating. And our our third one's even, yeah, yeah, third one's even crazier than our son. So you know, they're alive. I'm very proud of that. My uh, children, congratulations my children on having children that have all survived <laughs> thus far. Thank you. Like, I really want to congratulate you for that. We also Thank have you. done that to this point. Thank you. We should listen, moms, yeah. all of you, all of you congratulate no. yourselves. It is no. no small task. No, it is not. It isn't. Well, I, I'll, I'll share this honest. really quickly. We, you know, our daughter is no. six and our son is a year and a half old. And our daughter was, she's very feminine. We never had to child proof the house or anything. And our, our son, uh, and this probably will resonate for you with your son is I think like our son walks into yeah. the room and looks around and goes, yeah. what can I either break or break myself on? Like that's, that's the filter that he looks, sees the world through. And correct. Yeah. Yeah. How can we, I try call, to kill myself today? Man. Like he, like yeah. last night he was like standing in the dishwasher and he's like poking at the dog's eyes. And I'm like, our daughter didn't do any of these things, but I think, I don't know if it's a boy girl thing or just, you know, yeah. if they're all, no. they all come out. We're all, like you said it, we're all just so unique in the way we show up. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Ready for the therapy question. I've been yeah. alluding to this for a while and here it comes. Yeah. Uh-oh. Lots of tissues you know, whatever you need here. All right. Perfect. (laughs) I'm ready. What's something you're afraid might actually be true about you? Mm. Oh, there's many things that I'm not (laughs) even afraid are true about me. I'm very confident they're true about me. Uh, Which one, which one to elicit? (laughs) I have been, I have been told on good authority many times in my life that I initially come across 
as I'm mm-hmm. intimidating on on first appearance. And these very same people then will go on to say, once they get to know me, they realize I'm just another <laughs> coffee addicted uh stiletto high heel wearing girl who also happens yeah. to love power tools. So, you know, I think it doesn't take long before I certainly hope people that get to know me realize I'm I'm very down to earth, but I have been mm. told that very often that I'm afraid it's true. I tend to be intimidating apparently mm. on first first glance. But listen, I hope the second one everyone feels like they're seen, yeah. they're loved. Well, they your matter. brand is literally hammers and hugs, so that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Like that makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes so much sense. That's exactly right. Yeah, at least I'm, You're I'm consistent, consistent with if coffee else. and intimidation <laughs> followed by love. So, yeah. the second part of this question I always ask is, <laughs> how do you compensate for that thing that you know to be true about yourself? Like, what do you do to compensate for that intimidating and first impression mm. thing? I, I, it's hard to not tie it back to the kind of that message that, that I've already shared, but you know, the truth is it is so easy to judge a book by its cover. You know, we're so quick to make assumptions about people based on what we see or based on what social media tells us or based on what the news tells us. And whether we recognize it or not, we often assign value to people based on Mm -hmm. the way that we see ourselves. And for me, that message that I shared earlier, that concept of overcoming inadequacy and how do we do that? I mean, how, you know, I, I said it like it was the easiest thing in the world, but the fact is even in my own life, getting to that place where I recognize that my value is not in how I look. It's not in my achievements. It's not in anything that I can say or do, but is in fact in the God who created me. And for me personally in my life, the only way I was even able to come to that truth and embracing that reality in my life Mm -hmm. was through knowing Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. I mean, I took a supernatural... a supernatural um, intervention in my life. So I don't say that lightly. It really did take a divine encounter for me to truly be able to live out of that reality. But I have to say this, when you can truly embrace the fact that you cannot be redefined because you have been given infinite worth by a divine (laughs) creator, it changes not just the lens through which you see yourself, but then the lens through which you see the world, because whether we realize it or not, if I look in the mirror and I feel less valuable because I have more wrinkles, I will also, whether I recognize it or not, assign less value to somebody else who has more wrinkles. The lens through which we see ourselves is the same lens through which we see the world. So if you start valuing achievements in your own life, If you start valuing and feeling more worth it because you make more money, whether you realize it or not, you are assigning Mm -hmm. that same value to other people. And I want so badly to see the world the way that God sees me. Mm. And that is that I am loved and I am fully valuable outside of anything that I can say or do. And so, you know, when it comes to that sense of how do you see the world, it's that idea that when I look at myself in the mirror, I have to constantly fight to see a woman that's been created in the image mm-hmm. of God. And that is enough so that I can then see all the w- the women and men around me. And I see yeah, them the exact same way, not the wrinkles, not the success, not the failure. I simply see who they are because they have been made in the image of God and are just as loved. And so, but that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to allow yourself to yeah, see well, yourself Boyana, that way first. Like, if that was something that more people were able to connect, like connect to, whether it be spiritual or not, mm. but just the idea, mm. yeah, life changing and then, yeah, the, the the spirituality stuff. Yes, even if it's not a like a spiritual thing, but just what I yeah. hear in that that's more yeah. of like the general concept is being willing yeah. to see the similarities in who we are as humans. 
and being willing to see people yeah. in their greatness because we all have greatness inside of us. I'm, I'm a big believer in that too. And the coaching work I do, we call that your essence. And so for some people, they, yeah. their belief system is that essence is it comes yeah. from God. Some people believe that essence, you're just kind of born of it, but all of us have a, like, there's yeah. no one like us. And man, if it just, I'm just thinking about, you know, we're recording this on March 9th yeah. where the Ukraine and Russia is like in full force, just, and you're like all these, all these yeah. conflicts, yeah. both violent, but also nonviolent and the conflicts that happen in this world. It's just, yeah. you just learn to see that. And thing I'll add to that too, is assuming positive intent. Like the people, and I, I say this a lot, the people are generally, most of the people yeah. that I know are generally doing the best they've, the best they can with the tools they've been given. And I just, I just think yeah. that's such a beautiful message. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and it's humbling. I think for me at the end of the day, what it comes down to is this sense of extreme grace where, and we, we've we heard a lot about prayers for Ukraine and thinking of Ukraine, but I would also flip that a little bit and challenge you. Don't forget Russia. You know what I mean? I, like what a world to be living yeah. in where you could be so deceived and to the point where you truly believe that this is the right course of action. You know, that's a heartbreaking place to be too. Yeah. And what about the men and women in Russia who actually disagree with the course of action? Again, what a tough place to be in, but it's just this humbling sense of none of us is better. None of us is greater. You know, we, when we pray for peace and healing, make sure that it is a, a non-biased sense of I'm going to pray for Russia just as I'm going to pray for Ukraine, because at the end of the day, we are all human. We're yeah. all broken, and we we all need we all need that sense of grace if we're truly going to experience peace. Yeah. All right, Anna. I want to promote a couple things on your behalf. Coffee? I'm just kidding. Because I know you are a humble person. <laughs> coffee. I you're not not coffee. <laughs> so, you know, my question here is: I guess my guess, like, how can people connect yeah. with you? I want to actually highlight that you're a podcaster as well. So let's start with your podcast. What is the podcast? How can people find it on all the networks? And what's the and what's the premise of your podcast? My podcast is called the Imperfectly Empowered Podcast. No shocker there. And I am... Yeah, no shocker. <laughs> Again, consistent. I have a lot of faults, but consistency is not usually one of them. You are consistent. Um, I am on all of the different platforms, but my home base really where I tell everyone to get that cup of coffee and come on in is my website at hammersandhugs.com. That's hammers, letter N, hugs.com. Um, all of the links to my podcast and my blog, my fitness and nutrition program, which is virtual, by the way, for anyone interested, is is all there as well as you can learn mm -hmm. a little bit more about my my sweet, crazy family but that's sort of the one-stop shop easy to get to hammersandhugs.com yeah amazing we will be putting both of those in the show Sweet. notes so people can we'll take care of the work for you just click on click on it in the show notes. perfect All right, Anna. i want to thank you so much for being on for bringing your coffee truth <laughs> and your children truth and all the truths like uh, the deep I, I like this this is such a cool conversation because we went really deep onto like life changing yeah, stuff. And we talked about dead animals. And we also learned that your ultimate horror movie is like <laughs> and that well and then we like I'm picturing the movie Child's Play except in except it's like a killer raccoon. <laughs> like that would actually be your worst nightmare. A killer raccoon. Like some sort Lord of small ever. animal that comes Sounds after terrible. you. Terrible. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Thanks, exactly. we have nightmares tonight. So last thing. Perfect. <laughs> Thank yeah, no problem. Well, I have nightmares that you like blood and guts and that you like you're cool with a dead body in your yard. That that's uh... very creepy. <laughs> All right, so Anna, if you would leave us all with some words mm -hmm. of wisdom and we'll keep it yeah. short and sweet, right? So this is like the kind of the one sentence, the tagline. What do you want to leave us with today? The truth is rarely found in the extremes, but somewhere in the middle. Fight hard for that middle ground. Oh, I love that. I love that. It That reminds me of something I read once, or maybe I was told this when we were doing premarital counseling is like the marriages are, are marriages are not um, 
are not won or lost in the downs yeah. and the ups. Yeah. It's in the middles. Because the downs, you're probably going to be there for each other. The ups, you're going to be having fun. It's like, oh, the right. day-to-day routine. You're like, this is what we want to do. So I think, but I think as I think about expanding, I think that's true for everything. Like your job, it's like when things are kind of normal, when parenting, you're running your business, like there's going to be the ups and the downs. So I think that's just like really mm. beautiful wisdom that applies to all areas. So I want to wish you the very best of, I'm not even going to say luck, <laughs> wish you the very best in Thank podcasting you. world, in the brand world, the hammers and hugs, the house, the kids, all that. I am so glad we made this happen. Thank you so much. Thanks, for being Jason. On, uh, Thank you for the change you're being in the world. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to another episode of Talking to Cool People with Jason Frizzell. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and give us a shout out or take a moment to leave a review on iTunes. If something from today's episode piqued your interest and you'd like to connect, email us at podcast at jasonfrizzell.com. We love hearing from our listeners because you're cool people too.